Well, hello friends, David Vos here, and boy, is it a beautiful day in Oklahoma. Uh, I can't say the sun's come out yet, but it's trying to peek around the clouds, and uh, we're told it's going to be sunny tomorrow. We're looking forward to that, because we've had some rain, and it's been cool, but it's it's nice. Friends, I hope you're having a wonderful day where you are. <sighs> Um, I know that times are hard for some people and, um, you know, it, it, to me, it seems like everything has changed in the last, I don't know, 13 months already, you know, we ain't even, we're not even into tribulation, but, um, I feel a sense of foreboding. I mean, how could you not? I was reminded of this. Every day, I'm going to be careful what I say, but I'm reminded every day how ridiculous our world is. I try to go into a grocery market and can't go in. I haven't been in Walmart in many months. I don't go anywhere. I don't go to McDonald's. Um, I don't feel welcome there. Of course, I don't suppose they want me there. I mean, this is their chance to, you know, get everybody to only go through the drive through and it's much easier for them. But it's difficult because it's like the we're waiting for the boom to drop. We just don't feel like, how could this get any better? It's been getting steadily worse. And how could it have gotten steadily worse for our entire lifetime? Every day, every day, every... Turn on the television, there's another... Shooting, another murder, another terrible crisis, another Ponzi scheme, another lie, another... I mean, the news is lying directly at us. You, How could this go on? You'd think somebody would say, this is crazy, let's shut this down. But it just got worse. And we get more cynical. Nothing gets done because... You know, maybe we started off thinking, well, we'll vote somebody in there that will do something. And then we find out that they control the voting machines. You know, I don't know how many people really and still believe that the way things are, that you could actually vote and that your vote would count anymore. That is very ominous to me. It feels difficult, but the reason why I think for most people that we're not just falling apart, I mean, I think people would be sad and critically sick and ill and everything emotionally. But I, and this is going to sound crazy, but I think they, when, when they told everybody to go in and quarantine for a year and don't come out and don't go anywhere and all this stuff, don't drive. We're shutting down the libraries, the parks. We can't go to the restaurants and just sit and lounge around. We can't do anything. We can't go to the beach. But I think that the reason, or that, well, all the while, they were putting these phones into everybody's hands for a couple of three years ahead of time. We were all getting these fancy phones, oh, for the last 10, 15 years. But it's been building up to where now, just about the same time that all this happened, you can watch all your favorite shows right on your television or, I mean, on your phone. I mean, you don't even need cable. People don't even have cable. When did that happen? I mean, things are moving fast. So you can literally watch your propaganda right on your own television. And so um, it's it's like another life. It's like a pretend life. And people are living in pretend world. They're sitting, their free time, they're, they're playing games on the the big screen television. What do you do with a big screen television? Well, you hook your phone up to it and you run a wire or wirelessly or whatever and you stream YouTube. That's what people are doing or Netflix. And so people are entertaining themselves. That's not entertainment really. I That's what they call it. But what it is is drumming out your mind. It's like a drug. It's the way that we're keeping ourselves alive. A lot of people. And I confess, I'm on this phone a lot. But the reason is, and I tell myself, well, I should get off this. I don't like this phone. 
I feel like this radiation coming out of the phone is hurting me, maybe even giving me a headache. You know, it feels like I can tell. I mean, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I feel it. If I stare at the phone for a couple hours, I'm, I feel like I have a headache. My eyes hurt and I don't think it's safe. I really don't. There are people all around that feel this way. And we're people out buying little beanie caps that's supposed to protect you. And I have friends before that that used to wear tinfoil on their head when they went to bed at night. And this is how the what I was talking about, like the foreboding, the the ominousnessness. <laughs> it is just frightening because we don't know what to do. But but we but the, and they knew we wouldn't be happy if we didn't have family. You know, for my whole life, my entire life, I have been. You know, I, I didn't even know the word for it, friends. I didn't know. I thought it was okay. Just normal. Well, poor me. I didn't want to complain, right? But, you know, somebody the other day, thank goodness they said the word. And they explained to me that it was okay for me to use this word and for me to feel this way and to understand the truth about my life. But there's a guy, and I don't remember now his name, but anyway, he's famous. You may have seen him. He, he's always on there. He's talking about, oh, I, it's Lloyd... Um, Lloyd something. Anyway, he, he interviews people and does videos about Jehovah's Witnesses. As you guys know, I used to be a Jehovah's Witness. Grew up, was born into it. Was disfellowship thrown out for no cause. And I've done videos about it. It's terrible. But you see, even though in my own mind and heart, I knew it was unfair. And I knew, I mean, I'd lost my mother, my father, my brothers, my sisters. I mean, in some way or another, I lost everybody. Except my, my little girl. I still have my daughter. And, you know, my mom passed away, so I didn't really lose her in that sense, but I did lose her, and my sister passed away. And, uh, you know, I don't know that I can actually, you know, I actually, in many ways, blame the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses for that. My mother died at a very young age. Um, well, I mean, you know, young comparatively. And she didn't need to die that young, but there was a lot of stress that she had in her life for years, I think contributed to her her cancer. And then now we're finding out that probably the aluminum and the mercury and the food and the, the air and the water we drink is probably contributing to all that. So yes, somebody actually killed my mother and that makes me upset. That's another thing that bothers me. But you see this man that does these interviews, he, he, he recently did a, a video. I don't know if he, I think it was recently and I watched it. And I've watched several of them now and they've really given me some insight because I now understand he used the word that I hadn't actually been brave enough to use in my own mind, I guess. But he says that that it, that what is going on is that I'm a victim of hate. I'm a victim of hate and, and, and you might say violence in a sense, emotional violence. And I've been abused. And I've been treated, I've suffered. You know, these are words I didn't even think of to use. But when you are, uh, I don't even know if I can remember the word that I'm thinking of. But you know how in our society, I think it's pretty much all around the world now, they're, they're using these words for people like transgenders. Why you're, you're, uh, that you can't say anything bad about transgenders or, um, you know, a race or anything like that, because that would be not just unkind, but it's literally hate speech. And you can go to jail. Well, perhaps uh, I don't know what I what I feel about that, because I don't think that we can force people to love. And I don't think we should force people to be happy or to be kind. And that's got to be something from our heart. So I would not, if if the world just didn't pay attention to idiots who were sour pusses and were treating, you know, speaking badly about others, I think a lot of that would just go away. <clears throat> but, I don't know. I mean, I may have, I don't know if I wanted to put it that way. I don't know if it just go away. I mean, it's always going to be the human nature. You know, we, we sometimes get depressed. We say things to hurt people or whatever. But what would perpetuate racism what would perpetuate hate other than people being taught hate from the time that they're born and where do we get taught this kind of thing huh religion 
And uh, we see on television, we're told, uh, oh, look at these people. They hate each other. And they're just, they're showcasing the hate. And then our country goes along for years saying that all Muslims are bad. And we got to go and kill them all. And it, it looked really like, well, Dave, what are you going to do? They're killed. They're, they're come over here trying to kill us. We got to go kill them. But all along, we were being lied to. It was our CIA. And you know what? I'm going to stop right there on that because I don't want to. I think you guys could fill in the blanks what I'm going to say there. But I think they gave us these phones and all the propaganda, not only to brainwash us and give us propaganda, but they made it entertaining because they knew that it would keep us busy down in our basements. And people might not complain as much if they had something to do while they were down. I mean, do you imagine if we had no phone and we had no nothing to watch or do while we're sitting in our basement waiting for a year for, you know, for the uh, government to get delete our jobs and our churches. We're not allowed to go to church. Um, which, you know, I don't care. I, I, I don't go to church. But it's not about that. It's about the way, the lies that they're spinning to get us to do things that people don't, wouldn't normally want to do. So people are on their phones and it's killing them. And, um, uh, I think that instead of going out in the streets and complaining, people are getting desperate. I think there's probably a lot of suicide in the world today. And a lot of people just literally, you you know, today you wouldn't even know if there was a lot of people committing suicide or anything because a lot of the people that would probably want to commit suicide or something like that, like in the old days, they might end up being forced into some mental health treatment. Now, I'm not saying that would even help them, but they would be given these medications, quote, uh, medications, because they come up with some, how your depression is just some kind of disease or something wrong with you or disorder, and they give you these drugs that kind of keep you in a stupor. So nobody is complaining as much because you're either on some kind of drug drooling in your bed drinking whiskey or whatever because we're out we're certainly not out doing the things like playing football we're not even allowed to do that baseball school hasn't even been going on most places people don't even go to school they know libraries or any uh public you, you know courthouses are shut down there's martial law in idaho How, why are we paying taxes i'm going through little towns this has been going on for years and, and people just not paying any attention. But I'm going through these little towns and little roads and two-lane roads all throughout Texas and New Mexico and everywhere I've been. And there's potholes the size of, uh, you could lose a house in there. I mean, you, you, you it's just ridiculous. We're in a third world country. There's trash all over the place. So all of this is happening. And we're not really allowed to say anything about it. There, when we try to speak up and go on our uh, social media, to, on our little social media platforms, and we say something about or expose something, we're put, they take our account away. Thousands upon th millions of people all around the world have lost their social platform. They took down their channels. They... Some of them are even literally in jail. I just talked about this guy, Ammon Bundy, who lives in Idaho, who was now put in jail four times in the last few weeks just for protesting at the courthouse, at the Capitol in Idaho. And um, he didn't do anything. He's a very mild-mannered man. He wasn't holding up a sign or anything. He was just sitting in, 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 the, in an open uh legislature the house there just sitting sitting in a in a, in a free seat it wasn't hardly anybody there he wasn't making a scene he wasn't yelling at anyone he wasn't disturbing anyone but they literally his presence was threatening 
And just, and even though it's illegal, but you see, well, evidently it's not illegal anymore because they've declared that Idaho is under martial law and that governor is a dictator. So uh, they're allowed to just arrest anybody anytime they want. And this is going all around the world, but not to everybody. If it was happening to everybody, maybe we would rise up. But it happens here and there, and then they publicize it. They put it on TV so that you know that if you do that, that's what's going to happen to you. So you you see, we were talking about yesterday how when they get this um, system established, and we we I I haven't been told what's going on, even though. Everybody knows, like in the government, they know what they're doing. And they know that if we catch on to what's really going on, we might say something. So we don't even know what's about to happen. The big wigs already know. They got this set up. It's called the QFS. You know, financial system, a quantity, uh, a quantum financial system, which is going to be a computerized AI. Artificial intelligence is going to be running our country. And I don't know when it's going to fully be Im- implemented, but probably this year. And it has to do with the banks. And this computer is going to control all the finance and cryptocurrency. Your assets, which is you yourself, your life, your uh, your the fact, you know, your biological self is is worth millions and millions and millions of dollars to them. So they take your birth certificate, which is written on bond paper, and it's sold on the stock market. And that is an asset. And so this entire system that's coming, uh, going to be, it's, you know, there was already an executive order, 177322 or whatever, I don't remember the number, that Trump signed into law. It's already been signed into law. They're working on it right now. They're getting it set up. This is what the cryptocurrency is. And you will be able to buy and sell. Everything you you, you in the world will have a a GPS location and basically will be, um, have a, 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 like a number, like a VIN number or whatever. And that will be registered in blockchain, including every asset in the universe. So it's like slavery. And the thing about that is, is once we all get in there, there will be no other way to buy or sell. There'll be no other way to live or eat or breathe or anything. And then whoever's running the computer, and we don't know, you know, it's these. there's a council of individuals that are going to be running this thing. And if they deem you a terrorist, I mean, they literally have said that terrorists will not be able to buy or sell. Oh, goody, we're going to get rid of terrorism. We're going to get rid of all crime because nobody can can function unless because if you've done something wrong you get a a little mark on your your uh record it's like you get bad credit you can't buy or sell now right but it's going to get much worse you won't even be able to eat and so what's going to happen is it's, it's going to force people to comply and people will be fra- afraid. You know how I noticed this for years. People have been doing kind of crazy things just to keep their credit score up. So they can, you know, for a lot of people, it felt like to them, like if they didn't have good credit, they, they just couldn't function in society. Couldn't go out and get an apartment or a house or a car. And if they didn't have a car, they couldn't get to work. So it's already kind of been implementing. But it's all going to get uh, wrote into a program and be activated very soon. But all of this is happening. And we know what's happening. But we got so many things to, you know, so many in- intimidations. I mean, well, look, if you don't like it, you know, we'll come and take your children or we'll, you'll get fired or, or whatever. And I know uh, some of you might think I'm exaggerating on this, but I don't believe so. But you know, when I was watching this guy, uh, that has this YouTube channel about ex Jehovah's Witnesses and so forth. I was watching this young woman. Um, she was interviewing this woman, and she was related to Stephen Lett, I guess. I didn't even know the guy. I'd never. I've seen him because he's so crazy. And somebody sent me a video a long time ago. He was a, the way he talks. Uh, he's more or less the spokesman. They make these videos now 
for the Jehovah's Witnesses to watch. And he's this real flamboyant, and I don't know what word to use, but he's like, Jehovah loves everyone who obeys him, but he hates you if you disobey. I mean, I don't know how he talks, but it's really, really, really crazy. And I can't stand to watch him. But anyway, this guy had has been contacted by Stephen Lett, this guy that I'm talking about, his niece, I think it is, or his, see, it's his, um, yeah, I think that's her uh, uncle. I'm not sure, sh- I think. Her, her, her aunt, he's, I know, Stephen Lett is married to this woman's aunt, okay? So she grew up with this guy for her whole life and he was asking her questions of what is he like and so forth. And the reason she agreed to do this interview is because her brother uh, was eight years or six years, I think, eight years, younger than her. And she said she was 41, so. But she was Jehovah's Witness all her life, but her brother came out that he was gay, I guess some years ago. And of course, he was... After he came out, he was disfellowshipped and he went into Great Depression and he tried killing himself many times. And it was really, really, really hard. Really hard on her. Really hard on him, for sure. But it was hard on her because they were very close growing up. Because her mom was single, I guess, or something, so she helped raise her her, her brother because he was eight years younger. And so they were very close. She said she had a very unique Uh, a stronger relationship than most brothers and sisters. So when this happened to him, it really broke her heart. And then when he finally did, I guess it was just recently that he committed suicide. And it was very tragic. And my heart goes out to her. And if anybody who's listening knows her, my heart goes out to, to this whole situation. But this guy who does the interview, he's, I think he's trying to be you know, he was trying to be, um, he had to be careful, you know, because you're talking about somebody who just committed suicide and you don't know what to say. And I'm sorry, I know you've been through a lot and everything. And he's interviewing her. And he doesn't know what to, what to ask her. He didn't want to hurt her feelings or make her cry or anything. But the woman chose, she contacted him. She says, I want to come out publicly about this. She says, I realize that I'm going to lose my association with my family. They're not going to talk to me anymore. I'll probably get disfellowshipped. And, but she says, I have to come out because she says, I was already kind of fading a bit in my belief in Jehovah's Witnesses after my entire life as a Jehovah's Witness. She started kind of being disillusioned anyway, and probably because of her brother had a lot to do with it and stuff, but also because, you know, this guy, her, her, was it her uncle? I don't know. You know, she grew up with this guy and she says, he's just kind of a... a normal guy and it seemed very odd that he you know was now telling everybody around the world how to act and how to behave and what to do and this guy is more or less uh, convincing millions of Jehovah's Witnesses all around the world to to shun their family members but when this happened she says maybe I guess a matter of days or weeks after her her brother committed suicide. He gets up and does this public talk, and I guess it's on a video. And he showed a little bit of it on there. And he says that he gave an example that in the new world, this is what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. They believe that people will be resurrected back into the new world. And there'll be a thousand years and they'll have to learn. And it, it, I guess they believe that it takes about a hundred years or more and some people will have an opportunity to change and conform themselves to Jehovah's standards. Jehovah doesn't lower his standards for you. You must raise your standards to his level. So, of course, Jehovah doesn't like gay people and doesn't like that behavior. Let me let me be clear. That's how they put it. And and I know a lot of Christians believe that. And uh, and I personally, I will. I'll tell you what I what I think about this in a minute. But first, I want to explain what they're doing, and this ties in with what we were talking about 
So we'll we'll show how this ties in here in a minute. But I'm watching this and I see the tragedy and I realize, number one, I've been through this my entire life. My family wouldn't disown me. I haven't had a family. I have, I, I, he did another video too where this guy was disfellowshipped and he actually sued, I think he lived in the Netherlands and he sued Joe's witnesses and won. And so there are countries somewhere like in the Netherlands that's cracking down on Jehovah's Witnesses and they're saying that, look, maybe your religion, that's what you do, disfellowship people. But it's when you announce from the platform that all of these individuals that are in this church have to shun their brothers, sisters, family members, friends, you're telling them to shun them. That's kind of like in our country, it's illegal to have hate speech to say, well, that guy's transgender, so don't talk to him and treat him differently. You can't treat people differently. That's discrimination. That's the word I was looking at. I've been discriminated against and I didn't even, you know, understand. I didn't put it into context. I felt discriminated against my entire life. I lost my entire family, my whole everything, my, my whole, I mean, my happiness to, to, to see my father, my relatives, my best friends, everything I, I had in life was taken from me. This is way worse than, than people who are transgender or gay or whatever going through. Because uh, at least for them, they have a chance of their family accepting them. But if you're a Jehovah's Witness, you're just discriminated against. And people literally get up on platforms and tell everybody not to talk to you. You might lose jobs. You might lose your family, your children, everything. So it was really, really bad. And so here's this lady talking about how she lost her brother and it was really hurting me. And I could see the, the pain in this woman. She feels so sad inside because of what they did to her brother that she is now willing to lose her life. She's only 41 years old. She's going to lose her, probably her family. She's got children, I know. I don't know if she'll lose uh, some, you know, her, well, her family life is going to change. Her mother, father, brother, all these people are going to start shunning her. I, I was thinking, oh, ma'am, you have no idea what you're initiating into your life. You're from the, you'll never have a life again. But I'm so proud of her do, for doing it. Because what she said was, is that she had to expose this, even though she knew it was going to cost her basically her life. But she had to expose it. Because she doesn't want anybody else to have to commit suicide or to end up that depressed and, and, and everything. Now, I know a lot of Christians would watch that and they'd probably say, well, I don't know. I kind of agree with Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't believe in gays, right? That's not right. That's a sin. We've got to stop allowing sinners into the church and we've got to preach the fire and the brimstone. And if, and if we don't tell them, then this God of anger and wrath will, you know, send them to hell and we don't want that. So we've got, so this is their excuse. They, they, Joe's Witness have a little different way of doing it than other churches probably. I suppose in some churches they would just say that if we don't warn these people, the wicked, of their wicked ways and make a consequence for their behavior, then they'll lose their eternal soul. So they're thinking, I guess, that they're doing a good thing by being uh by you know intimidating and 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 shunning and it feels like hate they may not you know i don't know i think some of these people have convinced themselves that they're not hating they're loving you by telling you're a sinner but the thing of it is it's hate because they they it's not they don't have to do it in a mean way they don't have to uh I think a lot of people have literally hate some people. I really do. So, I mean, I'm stuck here as I'm telling you this because now this is bringing up so many thoughts in my mind. I don't know where to go with this. But what I had meant to do is to tell you that some of these, that there are going to be a lot of people that are going to agree with Jehovah's Witnesses on this. Some of the people on my channel might hear me talking, say, well, Dave, I know you're, you're into love and forgiveness and grace and you don't believe in 
law of Moses and all of that. But come on now, Dave, we can't be allowing murderers and thieves and gay people, you know, in the church, right? And we should condemn them or else they're going to lose their eternal soul. Okay, I get it. But here's the sadness. I'm watching this organization and I'm realizing that they're all being led along to a precipice with false concepts into a false conclusion. And it's a brainwashing technique. And it's intimidation. Because if you don't disfellowship your family members, then you could lose your family too. You'll lose everything. So mothers have to disfellowship their children and never speak to them again. Because they don't want to lose the rest of their family. Because they don't want to lose their lives. Because they don't know where to go or what to do. And they actually believe. They've been indoctrinated to believe that the God of love is somehow going to punish them in eternal damnation or whatever it might be that they believe in that church is going to happen to them. And that is very, very sad. That's the problem with this world. That everything we've women been told is a lie. And it's being encouraged. And people don't know what they're doing and people are running around teaching false information and there is a motive now here's the thing i have a different take than the guy who runs that channel i wish i knew his name he's lloyd or something i don't know some of you may know who it is i look when i get on here i don't do any research and get right down anything or names i don't pay attention to who it is that i'm watching on youtube He's just a very popular guy that talks about Jehovah's Witnesses. And I think his name is Lloyd. And you probably could find out who it is. But um, I disagree with him because I think his stance was, well, I'm doing these videos because I'm helping to expose Jehovah's Witnesses. Look at how bad they are. But in some ways, I'm not sure that's working. Because most people are going to watch that. Lots of Christians are going to watch this and go, oh, well, I guess I agree with Jehovah's Witnesses because they don't like gays either. <laughs> they don't, you know, I talk about transgenders all the time because I don't believe there's such a thing. So what causes people to believe? Well, it's propaganda. It's lies. How can you punish a child? A little child walking around with a sucker, right? With his pants down around his ankles. He's... You know, nobody's changed his diaper. Um, he's hungry, crying because he's hungry, or her, him or her, and 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 he's spoiled rotten. He's 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 throwing a fit and he's screaming. And you say, "Well, that's a bad baby, bad baby." Well, oh, that's a bad baby. See, the idea that Christians have, whether they're Jehovah's Witnesses, Baptists, or Lutherans, or whatever, and I think secular people have the same concept, is it? Somehow or we got to blame people for the wickedness that's in this world. How in the world can you blame that little baby running around with a snot, snotty nose with his pants running down behind his, on his ankles because he's spoiled rotten? It's the parents' fault. Well, you can't blame the parents either because they were taught by the government and by their religion and by this wicked world. No one's ever taught how to love in this world. So therefore, nobody knows how to love. And let's say for a moment that it was a sin against the divine being to be gay. By the way, there isn't anywhere in the Bible in the New Testament. Remember, the Old Testament's against everything. And for a lot of things were against, like genocide. They're for that in the Old Testament. Slavery. They're for that in the Old Testament. Sacrificing animals, and even children, like Abraham tried to do with his son, Look, there's a lot of things in the Old Testament we're not for, but that God Yahweh's for. He's the God of vengeance. And Jesus said, if you don't know, this is what, I'm teach, what I teach in these videos. But Jesus said, your father, speaking to the Sanhedrin, your father is the devil and he's a liar and a murderer. And when they asked him, should we stone the woman for adultery? He said, no. So there's this little argument going around where um, Jehovah's Witnesses say, and probably a lot of churches, that um, if you don't murder people because they did something wrong, you don't stone women anymore. Job's Witnesses don't stone them. They just shun them. So they don't stone them. And so you show them a scripture in the Bible which says stone women. And Job's Witnesses don't do that anymore. 
So then you say to the Jehovah's Witness, and then why are you shunning them? If you don't, if you say, well, you're doing it because the Bible tells you to do it. Why aren't you stoning people? Well, they would rightly say you're twisting the scriptures to some extent, although they're twisting the scriptures too. But here's from their point of view. They'll say, no, no, that's the Old Testament. We're not under the Old Testament. We're Christians. In the Old Testament, they stone people. Jesus said, we're going to have forgiveness now. God will do the stoning when he comes in the second coming and then he'll kill everybody that's bad. But we're not supposed to do the stoning because the Lord has given us his grace for a period of time. While we go out and spread the good news of the gospel and, and, and ask people to repent. Now, if they don't repent, then when Jesus comes, he's going to kill them all. So, okay, if that's what they believe, then they're doing what they think is right. And how can you condemn them when they don't know they've been taught this stuff? How can you condemn a, a Baptist for being a Baptist? They're born and raised in it. They don't know any better. They think it makes sense. God's got to punish the wicked. Why look at all the wickedness? What are we going to do? Keep, let the people murder and steal and cheat? They don't understand that people murder and steal and cheat, partly because the God of the Old Testament murders and steals and cheats, sends lying spirits down and, 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 and genocides people and tells us to go to war and teaches his hand for warfare and says his name is Jealous and, and he'll kill anybody. who he, he will not pardon anybody's sin. And partly because the governments have taken up this whole line of reasoning and were taught patriotism and war and all this stuff in every country and nation. Muslims are, are, are taught that, you know, all the religions are bad and Christians are taught they're bad. And, you know, everybody's taught baloney. And we're perpetuating all this garbage. And you say, well, what, we just throw up our hands. What are we going to do? How about... We go on a campaign and we start loving one another. Do what Jesus said and love one another. Put your arms around people. Show them how to love. We love because he first loved us. We don't know how to love unless somebody shows us. So they have it all completely backwards. So they're saying that the New Testament actually teaches this. Well, it doesn't actually teach this. If it did, then why would Jesus be the friends of tax collectors and uh, sinners, and gluttons, and wine-bibbers, and uh, prostitutes. Why is it that they stoned Jesus? Because the law condemns thieves, like the two on his right and his left, and condemned Jesus simply because Jesus didn't want to get down on his knees and bow to a god because he said, what kind of a deity? You ask for bread and he gives you serpents. I have compassion on the people. Your father's a liar. You know, he doesn't want you to have eternal life. Yahweh says, you know, I do not partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that you might become like God. But Jesus said, this means eternal life to take in knowledge of God, to become like God. And not only that, Jesus says, I'm going to give you the tree of life. All you get is believe in me and follow after me. If you'd ask me, I'd have given you eternal waters, living waters that will bubble up from your innermost being. All you got to do is believe. And Jesus never once condemned anybody except when he came to the Pharisees who thought they were righteous. He didn't say, I condemn you. He said, your sin remains until. Because what you judge, you shall be judged. So if you keep judging others that way, you're going to be judged the same way. But not by me. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to do it. He said, you have one that condemns you and that is Moses. I have come to give you life, and that more abundantly. So you see, it has to be purposeful. Whoever started these teachings, these lies, but now, because of the continual programming and propaganda, every week people go to church, people go to church, and they're not just reading the scriptures and praying on their own. They're simply reading out of books that the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society or uh, Seventh Day Adventist and the Pearl, of, you know, or the uh, the Great Controversy, or whatever book you're reading from, a marvelous work and a wonder. If you're a Mormon or whatever, and you're learning your teachings from men who claim to be superior to you, and yet Jesus said, "Don't call any man your father. Don't you don't need offices." A lot of people think that elders is an office. That's not what that is. That means somebody that's older than you have. Honor the older ones among you. That's all it means. 
What, don't they get appointed date? No, you point them out. That's what that Greek word means. It doesn't mean that you appoint them into an office and they have a, a, a special office. This guy on this Jehovah's Witness, guy that exposed Jehovah's Witnesses, he was talking, and I didn't even know this, but because this woman who, who has been around this governing body member all of his her life, 41 years, she says that he lives in a very m modest apartment. He's not wealthy, and he has, but he has a big office, either there in his home or, or next door. Well, I suppose you would need a place or a desk or, you know, even I need a place to sit down and a desk for my, you know, stuff or whatever. Um, I'm not begrudging anyone for a desk, but the office, all that responsibility that they put on this one man, when Jesus said, you're all just brothers and sisters. Anyway, this man or this organization or these books are teaching people such lies. So I would disagree. And I would say that when you expose this kind of thing, if you don't know exactly what you're doing, you're going to literally confuse people more than they were already. So when people, normal Christians, see that Jehovah's Witnesses are are standing up to sin and throwing out the sinners out of the church. They'll probably agree with them and they'll probably get more converts. So we have to, we don't want to approach it that way, guys. Because everybody's been taught in our society today that we shouldn't say anything about gay people. And, you know, so, well, all right. So, well, I'll tell you what I think about that situation here in a second. But before I get there, so if you don't understand the New Testament, how you can't expose Jehovah's Witnesses. You can't expose the Catholics or the or the Lutherans or the Baptists. You can't expose the Muslims. If you don't know the truth, then you can't be running around acting like you do. Now, it, it'd be fine to say, look, I don't approve of what Jehovah's Witnesses is doing. These people... Uh, whoever they are, nobody deserves to be shunned. And that I would agree with. But when they go and they start laughing and saying, oh, but I believe that, that gay people, that that's normal, and you don't put any context with that, then you're going to lose most of the world. Most people aren't going to understand what you're saying because, well, maybe today in our day and age, there's a lot of people that, you know, in society that, that would understand that. But it, But you're not, what you're really doing with a show like that is you're not really exposing Jehovah's Witnesses as a bad church. You're really just preaching to the choir because anybody who didn't like, who thought gay people were great and didn't like church and religion to start with would never be going to the Witnesses or to the Baptists or the Lutherans. So you haven't done anything for anyone. What you want to do is you want to show people, Baptists, Lutherans, and Jehovah's Witnesses that the New Testament actually doesn't teach that. That God is love. That Jesus said, I don't condemn you. Didn't condemn one person, ever. And the sword that's coming, when he comes again on his horse with a sword out of his mouth, that is simply the sword of the Spirit. It's out of his mouth. And so he's going to help keep people by loving them and offering them to weigh. Jesus will always be there waiting for anyone who is willing to hear the voice of the Lord and follow him. That's all you got to do. It doesn't mean, you know, people talk about, you've got to repent. They're mixing up the Old Testament with the New Testament. And so they're under this delusion. They got the veil over their face so they can't understand the scriptures. That's what the Apostle Paul says, that everybody to this day, when they read the, the scriptures, they read it with a veil over their face. When that is the veil is the, the law of Moses. It's the ignorance. It's the liar, the deity who is the God of vengeance, who, you know, Moses put a veil over his face and the people said, don't you, don't that deity talk to us, but you, Moses, you talk, we want a priesthood. Make a, uh, uh, give us a king. We don't, we don't want to be free. We want to be told what to do. Make some laws. Let's uh, throw some gold into the fire and it'll come out a statue and we'll worship it. That's idolatry. So what's happening is, is we've traded one form of idolatry for another. 
The ignorance in the world is still here. People are beginning to wake up, but we can't make wake people up by telling them half-truths. So what do I think about gay people? Well, look, in nature, if you go out and you look in nature, you see that most animals do just fine. You don't need to have a book to explain to them what sex they are. So if you knew, I mean, <laughs> the only way you would know, you know, uh, in this world what sex you were is you have instinctual inclinations, right? You feel um, attracted, right? How do we know we like flowers? Because we're attracted to the smell, the beauty, and we go there, oh, a beautiful flower. That's a natural thing. So some people say it's not natural to be gay. Well, natural comes from the instinct. If a person has these feelings, they could be coming from a natural instinctual place or they could be coming from some other place. The problem is, is that Christians have said they're coming from wickedness, from a wicked person. It's your fault. You're guilty. That's not what Jesus taught. When Jesus saw the prostitute, did he say, oh, yay, I'm so glad you're a prostitute? No, he probably didn't like that situation. But did he go over there and reprimand that woman and say, you terrible, wicked woman? No, because he understood that it wasn't her fault. That we were in a world that we were being lied to by the liar, this ego, this false, carnal, lustful, nasty, wicked world. He knew, number one, that woman was sold as a slave when she was probably 13. She didn't love the man that, that she was sold to. And so she ran away. Now, who's at fault there? Maybe she had children and she left her kids. Or something. Maybe there was something she did that wasn't quite, wouldn't be considered loving. We all, out of despair or the situation we're in, we make mistakes. But overall, Jesus had compassion on her. Why? Because he understood the law was not right. The law was arbitrary. You can't make a law that would make righteousness. The, see, the reason Jesus didn't believe in the law is because it's not good. Ezekiel 22, 22 says he gave them laws that were not good. So the law is not good. Now, there might be some things in the law that are good. Like if you find a wife or a husband and you have children, you probably should stay together and raise your children together. But what if you're a woman and you were sold to some old man. At, he, you're 13 and he's 50. And he's got 14 other wives. And all he does is, you know, make you work and, and tell you, uh, sh shut up and go sit down. And no, you can't do that. And, and, and you know, you got to go out and live in the barn. Now, maybe you should be so wonderful and courageous and have so much integrity that, you know, that for the sake of the children, you should just stay there in the barn. But you see, Jesus knew that he had compassion. He knew that woman wasn't happy. And maybe one day she fell in love with somebody else. And they were out far away from everyone and they were working in the field and they got to talking and the guy touched her hand and they ended up falling in love. Now, what do you do? Well, see, people today know that, well, let's have compassion on that. Most Christians do. They don't want to run around condemning everybody because they've had two or three marriages or something. So people are starting to buy, uh, they're starting to begin to kind of realize, but then they go back to the Bible and they've been brainwashed that the Old Testament part of the New Testament. So they're going, oh, well, uh, then I guess I don't believe in the Bible. Or they'll say, oh, well, I guess I don't understand the Bible. I'll just say, yeah, I believe it, but I don't read it. I'm just going to, you know, I'm secular or whatever. I don't understand it. Jesus was probably a good guy, but I don't know what it all means. Everybody's confused. The thing of it is, is that the law itself is wrong. Now, like I said, the Old Testament has many things you're supposed to do that we don't do anymore. In fact, we would, it'd be wrong to do it. What, genocide, murder, lying, war, all that stuff? Slavery? No, we don't do any of that. And as I said, most people don't realize that the twenty or the um, the twelfth commandment is reads this: 
You must sell your, when you sell your daughter as a slave, she shall never go out, become free as do the other slaves, but she will be a slave for the rest of her life. And that's what a, a marriage certificate or a bond or a bill of divorce or a bill of marriage is. That's how you get redeemed. That's why Jesus redeemed us. It was, we were purchased. You sign a contract. If you're under that contract. Theoretically, it's wrong to break the contract. Well, you kept, you know, you got to pay a thousand dollars for this car. You've signed the contract. Why it's wrong to break the contract. But let's say that the guy, you know, sold you this car and it don't run anymore. And you got to pay the payments, but you don't have the money for the payments. And you got to have a car to get to work. And this one doesn't run. He sold you a lemon. Would it, people realize that, that the concept of the contract is just a system where people lure you in to give you a benefit. Well, I'll give you this car. I know you can't afford it. You pay me 200 a month and um, then you can have a car. But you got to sign the contract. And if you don't, you don't pay all the payments, then I can put you in jail or something. Well, you signed the contract. Well, you did it because you didn't know what else to do. You needed a car. But you see, once you get into that situation and you got children to feed and your car broke down and you can't afford paying for a car that don't run, and it, the whole thing wasn't fair anyway. Yeah, you signed the contract, but it wasn't fair because the guy sold you a lemon. So what do you do? You probably just take that piece of junk back to his parking lot, drop it off and say, screw the contract. I'm not paying it. And it wouldn't be immoral. Because it's all wrong. The whole system's wrong. The contract was wrong. All this is wrong. And so if people are supposed to be, if a man's supposed to be with a woman, I imagine if we're all running around in paradise and we're all taught love and happiness and we're all on the same, you know, page, we probably, most men would probably be attracted to women. But we got young men going to prison. They don't have any women for years and they end up being uh, forced into situations We've got music and movies that's advocating it. We, we've got all this pressure all over the world. And here's another thing. This thing about male and female, ultimately, it's just a hormone that changes the difference between a male and female. It's just a, a estrogen or, or testosterone, testosterone or something like that. We're just human. We're just beings, really. And it's a fact, even in nature with animals, that if you put them in a weird situation, they can end up, you see dogs humping, male dogs humping male dogs sometimes. You see uh, roosters or, or hens, do, you, know, you see cats, you see buffalo. This happens in nature. So it's not like, oh, I saw a dog, it was a male dog, you know, doing this weird thing and we had to go out and shoot the dog. No, who cares? Let the dog do whatever they do. And what is this? You know, we're not into law. That might be a good dog. That might be your best hunting dog. The most loyal dog you've ever seen. Great in every way. But he's some strange dog there. We got to shoot that one. Look, this doesn't make sense. I don't know because I don't know everything. So I don't know if if you had a world where everybody was free and everybody was happy, we're all living in paradise, perhaps there was 10 women and 10 men were dropped down, didn't know books, no knowledge, no nothing. They had to start from scratch. And they all started walking around looking at each other, all standing around naked. Would five, would the 10 men all pair off with 10 women or would it, we don't know. But whatever it would be, maybe it would be nine men and nine women that would pair off. And the other two men and two women, or the other one man and, let's see, let's say, no, let's say eight men and eight women paired off. So now you got two women and two men left. Maybe those two, maybe it'd be the, the two of the women would, would pair off because they didn't like, there weren't any men there that they liked. They fell in love. Who knows? But what if they did that? Would you go, oh, well, that's just crazy. We read in a book somewhere that you're not allowed to do that. Uh, well, 
do whatever you want. This is what we want to do. Why are you bothering us? What book? We don't got any books. They wouldn't have books. They wouldn't condemn each other. Jesus said, I don't condemn anybody. Why? Because there is no condemnation in Christ. And we don't know whether or not, just because you don't have those feelings doesn't mean somebody else wouldn't. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. All I'm telling you is that Jesus never said, I'll tell you what, when I come back, you know, in my kingdom, I'm going to throw out all the gays. He never said that. There is a couple of verses in the New Testament. We'll forget the Old Testament. But there's a couple of verses in the New Testament. It says something about, it sounds kind of like it's something about gay people. But really, we don't know if it's talking about temple prostitution or some other kind of uh, prostitution or slavery or some other thing. It's ambiguous. There is not a verse anywhere in the Bible that says gay people are sinners and they need to, to uh, be put to death. It doesn't say that in the New Testament because number one, Jesus didn't teach us to put people to death or to shun anybody. It doesn't say anywhere in the New Testament you should shun people. Nowhere. Nowhere. People misunderstand a couple of verses in the New Testament. And I don't know that I want to even get into that here in this. Uh, this whole video has turned into a completely different video than I wanted to make. But okay, I better touch on that for a minute. But there is a place where it says that if anybody doesn't bring this teaching, this that, that we're teaching as the apostles, it says, do not have a meal with such a one. That's the way it says it in our Bible. And so we think, well, Job's witnesses teach that that means don't have any intimate fellowship with sinners. That's not what it's saying. The meal that it's talking about is the ceremonial meal, the initiatory early church celebration of the Lord's Supper, where people come and it was called the love feast. You fed people and everybody had, like it says, n n nobody had too much and nobody had too little. And they had all things common and they ate their bread in sincerity and truth from house to house. All that is saying is that it has nothing to do with with shunning people or anything. It has to do with a group of individuals that lived in a community, a more of a communal life. If you have a commune, you can think of that as kind of like your house. If you have a house, and let's say in your house, you have certain ideas and beliefs, and you, you are allowed to raise your children the way you want. So we're not talking about personal preferences. Oh, he puts jam on his toast, so we can't come in my house. No, no, I'm not talking about that. That would be uh, inhospitable. We're supposed to be hospitable. We're supposed to do that. But what I'm saying is, what if there were people that were headhunters or murderers, you know, in the next village over? Would you invite the murderers and the headhunters into your home? No. But would you not go to their village if you could, if it was safe and preach the gospel to them? What if you did and they said, oh yeah, well, hey, I'm, I'm interested. Come on into my home and tell me the gospel. Wouldn't you go into their home and tell them the gospel? Shouldn't we forgive people 70 times, seven times, everybody? Should we condemn anybody? Jesus didn't. No, he's simply talking about a situation they had in the early church where they had this communal order. Maybe they were nuns or they were they were uh, all celibate and they were uh, in, a, in a sort of a place where they did prayer and the whole place was dedicated to prayer. And they would have their communal meals. Now, let's say some guy came running in there and he started overturning the table and eating all the food and crapping on the floor. Well, he would be disturbing the gathering there. So not to eat a meal with such a person is just saying, if somebody's going to act like that, you don't have to let them sit down and disrupt your that holy meal. That's all it's talking about. It doesn't say anywhere, that was not the teaching of Jesus, that we're supposed to go around and marking people. Because Jehovah's Witnesses do that. They mark you. You know, if you're not bad enough to get to fellowship, they just put a mark on you. Or, you know, but... And another thing, when you do something wrong, if you did, 
You're supposed to forgive people, you know? But they will never, even if you repent and say you're sorry, they tell you, oh no, you got to wait a year or two or three or sometimes 10 years before they'll even forgive you. So they have a completely wrong idea of what the Bible is saying. It, and, and, and also when it says uh, in the New Testament that you shouldn't say a greeting to such a one, there's a place that says that. That's not saying you shouldn't say hi to people. Oh, he's wicked. Don't say hi to him. I don't approve of his lifestyle. Don't say hi to him. That's not what it's saying. It's saying don't say God speed or so. In other words, let's say somebody you 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 come along and these, these two people are are you know killing each other. Do you say hey God speed there, young man? Kill him, kill him fast. You know, no, you wouldn't say God speed or may the Lord bless you in your endeavor in killing that man. No, we don't say that. So. There's just a couple of verses in the New Testament that are, is just saying that if you see some terrible things going on, don't encourage it. Don't say, you, you just don't say go around blessing everything because some things shouldn't be blessed. Some things should be condemned, sure. And, and, and so sometimes people do things and we need to condemn that. But it doesn't mean that we condemn people and shun our brothers and sisters because they made a mistake or you know, look, if, if you've got somebody, a brother or a sister that's running around murdering people, I don't expect you to uh, invite this murderous person into your home. That's a personal thing. We all have to, you know, like I said, it's a scriptural thing. A bad association spoils useful habits. We shouldn't go to the bar and sit and, and, and sit and drink with the drunkards and we shouldn't, um, you know, watch violent movies and, but what if our friend watches violent movies? Well, as long as our friend's willing to communicate with us, we can encourage him to do better. You wouldn't say, oh, you know what? My friend watches bad movies and he does bad things. And, you know, I'm just going to cut him out of my life and never talk to him again. What you really should do is have compassion on that person and realize they're in the world. They don't know the truth. They're being brainwashed. We should always be a light. That's why Jesus said, you're the light of the world. You don't put your light under a basket or under the bed. You put it up on a hill or up on a candle stick, you know, right? Put it on a lantern, and hang it up on a on, on the, the top of the porch so everybody can see the, up the stairs when they're coming up the porch so they don't fall down. We're the light of the world. We have to be out there amongst the people. Now, Joe's witness would say, yeah, but our congregation, we teach them the truth. And it's so a family. And so if they're not doing what they know is right, then we have to shun them so that they'll repent. But the thing about that is that Jesus didn't do that. Jesus was there always. And it took time, even for the disciples, to, to grasp what Jesus was saying, to learn, to grow. We have to give people a chance. We shouldn't be condemning people because they smoke cigarettes or because they have a bad habit, or because people are struggling in this world. And this is completely wrong. So what we've got is a big mess. And so what do you do? Well, Dave, what you're saying is, is nobody knows anything, and we're all confused, and we should just throw up our hands and just give up. No, that's not it. People are confused, and we're being brainwashed. So this is the reason we have to have compassion for everybody. I don't blame Jehovah's Witnesses for the views that they have on some of these things. Although, when a parent shuns their child, their conscience should bother them. If it gets to the point where their conscience doesn't bother them anymore, when they, they, they don't love their family and their friends, and they're not considerate and kind, and they're judging everybody and condemning everybody, like Jesus said not to do, and they read this Bible every day and they don't notice it, then there is something wrong there. So here's the way I would look at it. Yeah, I wouldn't go to their kingdom hall because it's just a bunch of propaganda. I wouldn't go to the Baptist church because they're not teaching me the healthful teaching. So it is good to pick where you get your spiritual food. I would only use the scripture and prayer to get to be guided. Jesus said, you don't need a man to teach you. But when it comes to people in this world, we should never be harsh 
or con condemning people or judgmental because we have to understand, we have to have compassion on people. That's a completely different thing. And in conclusion, because we're well over an hour here, let me, let me say this. Why did Jesus not condemn the prostitute? Why did he not? I mean, wouldn't, according to Jehovah's Witnesses and most Christians then, why he was not very loving then. He was not pointing out their sins so that they could, you know, you, you can't just say, I forgive you. They hadn't repented yet. That prostitute, he didn't, you know, tell her how, what she'd done wrong and tell her to go out and do penance and, and then come back and then he'd forgive her. He just forgave her. Now, why? Why would the Lord do that? You want to know why? I'll tell you why. Because what Jesus was saying when he told the Pharisee, your sin remains, but the prostitute, her sin has been forgiven. I forgive her. I love her. She loves me. People who love you, those are your friends. People who hate you, I would probably stay away from them, but they made that choice, not you. But anybody who's willing to receive your love, to receive your friendship, to receive your counsel, why should you shun them? You're all the only light they have. I'll tell you why Jesus did that. Because he was trying to tell us that the law, that judgmental attitude, condemns everybody. Let's say this guy, this governing body guy, right, who condemns this young man because he was gay and says that in the new world, he's going to come back and be judged and lose his eternal life if he doesn't conform to the Lord's standards. And... According to them, the Lord's going to bring uh, this, these wicked people to ruin in the great judgment and flames of fire, right? Because he's angry every day with the wicked. But you see, the truth is the Lord's not angry. He doesn't get angry. The divine being is love. And he stands and he knocks at the door all day long and he's not going to stop knocking. Whoever opens the door he comes in. That's the way we should be with anybody. Anybody who's willing to come and talk to us and look at our sweet smile and hear about the Lord from our lips, we don't shun that person. Oh, like I said, you see some murderers, stay away from them. That's not the point. We don't shun and we don't condemn. And here's the reason. This guy gets up on the stage and condemns gay people because he's not gay and he don't understand it. So it must be wrong. And he doesn't want his congregation being gay and being taught gayness. So you got to get the gay people out, right? That's what he's thinking. But here's the problem. He's just condemned that person. The person felt so bad they went out and committed suicide. Now, where's that man, that governing body, this, what's his name? Stephen Lett. Where's he going to be on the judgment day? He's going to be where the Pharisee was. And that guy who committed suicide is where the prostitute was. The Lord, he, the guy that committed suicide felt sad and sick because someone else judged him and he lost his family over things that he, you and I probably don't even understand. He couldn't help it. Whoever gave him those feelings, whether they were natural or not, he had those feelings. He did the best he could. He, he didn't know what to do. He couldn't figure it out because there was no one there to help him, only people to condemn him. And he committed suicide. So in the judgment, what Jesus is going to do is going to say, look at Mr. Governing Body, your sin remains. You have never learned that we're all in the same boat. You don't understand that I loved everybody and, and these were my sheep and you, you sent them away. You, you caused them pain. And look, I'll, I'll forgive you even, but you must learn that you got to do what I'm doing. Forgive everybody and love everybody. So how is he going to feel? When he gets to the pearly gates and the Lord can see into his heart and knows every and all of his deeds and he looks into his heart and he sees, oh, Mr. Stephen Lett had probably looked at pornography in his life. Mr. Stephen Lett had done all kinds of terrible things. Maybe he's got all kinds of skeletons in his closet. You see, we're all in the same boat. So if you judge others by the same judgment that you keep judging you'll be judged why do they not 
look at the scriptures and see what it's saying. We're not supposed to judge for that very reason. And of course, let me say it again in case somebody doesn't understand. That doesn't mean we allow murderers into our home. But as long as even a murderer, if they were crying and needing somebody to tell them the gospel, I would still be there. And if I saw them hungry and on the street and naked, I would still clothe them and still talk to them and try to help them. Because the love that I show, even if it's difficult, it's sometimes it's hard to love people. But the harder it is, that means it, it's more difficult for us to love that person. Then that just means that the Lord is going to love us even more because the Lord, these are all his children and he's so he loves you so much when you start learning. Imagine what it's like to be the Lord. The Lord's perfect, right? And he's not, you don't have all these problems. And he looks down and he sees all of us and yet he still loves us. And he's still there and he lets the sun shine on the righteous and the unrighteous. And he lets it rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And he doesn't keep account of your injuries or your sin and he's only love and there's no darkness in him, only, only light. And you have been told that if the Lord can forgive you, then why should you not forgive those who tr trespass against you? That's what Jesus taught. And so he's going to be in a pretty, pretty bad pickle. Because the Lord's going to say, you condemned 457 people you disfellowshipped in your lifetime. You shunned them and condemned them. But you're a hypocrite, Mr. Stephen Lett. You're a hypocrite. Because you're a sinner too. And you know what? I'm going to forgive you, Stephen, when you can finally understand that you're no better than that prostitute or that guy that you condemned. We're all the children of the Lord and he loves us all. All of us. There's, you know, there's no difference. We're all in the same boat. We're all just the children of the living deity and we're all brothers and sisters the the idea that this man thinks he's the governing body in other words he's going to govern me he thinks he can govern us who's governing us the lord set us free he nailed the law to the cross by george if i'm going to nail the if the lord nails the law of moses to the cross and freed us from that then why would I want to put myself back into the bondage of some guy named the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses or Lutherans or some Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or, or, or any other church or some guy in a robe calling himself the Pope? I'm sorry, but they're the ones that are hypocrites. They're the ones that are judging and that will be judged as they judge. We are Christians and we must love and we must love everybody. And there's so many things that we, we didn't cover. We didn't even explain what really hell was and what this resurrection the Bible's talking about is and how this all works. Because if we did, we'd find out that the Lord has a plan to save everybody. So anyway, guys, I'm going to go ahead and go. And um, I love you guys and I hope you have a wonderful evening. It's David Vos. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a great one.